good day. In the immortal words of Han Solo, I prefer a straight fight to all that sneaking around. The stealth genre, ladies and gentlemen, is a genre I've never really got into. Back in the day, I did indeed prefer just shooting the enemy to sneaking around and stabbing him in the back. And it wouldn't be until a little game called Dishonored that I would finally give the stealth genre its due. And with that, let's take a look at Dishonored's developmental history. Dishonored itself was developed by Arcane Studios. Now this particular studio has been around for a fairly long time. First opening in 1999, and their very first game would be the fairly famous Arx Fatalis. And it would not be until 2010 that they would actually be acquired by Zenimax Media. Dishonored would spend three years in pre-production. The people working on that were Arcane's founder, Deus Ex developer Harvey Smith, visual design director Viktor Antonov, the person behind Half-Life 2's City 17, and art director Sebastian Milton. Later on, Deus Ex designer Ricardo Bear would come and become the game's lead designer. So already you can see that there's a great deal of talent behind this particular game from the very first days. And it would explain why this game has so much in common with Deus Ex. As with many games, Dishonored would undergo numerous changes while in development. Initially, it was supposed to be a thief-styled stealth game, where the player would have to stick to the shadows in order to not be detected. This was determined to be unrealistic, and it was felt that it would hide the graphical designer's work. One aspect of the game that the developers really had to fight for was the ability to punish the player for being evil. In Dishonored, you can indeed kill just about everyone in the bloody game. And of course, the game actually tracks this. If you are evil, you get the bad ending. If you are good, you get the good ending. Seems simple, right? Now, this particular concept began in development when developer Joe Houston saw a playtester systematically kill all NPCs in a level. He found that experience rather disconcerting, and thus he fought to have a certain event trigger late in the game if you killed everyone like bloody Jason Voorhees. Harvey Smith had this to say on the subject. Everyone just wants to be told in a video game that you're great, no matter what you do. If you slaughter everybody, you kill the maids, you kill the old people, you kill the beggars, you're great, here's a medal, you're a hero. We decided that that sounds psychotic. It doesn't match our values. What we wanted was to let you express yourself in the game, but to have the world react to that, at least in some way. To me, this makes perfect sense. If Corvo was an insane, drooling-at-the-mouth maniac, why would everyone love him and want to call him a bloody hero? Art design would also change as well. Initially, the game was to have been set in medieval Japan, but no one had any intimate knowledge with that particular culture. So it was then moved to London in 1666. But as development went on, modern innovations were added, such as electro barriers and floodlights. So finally they just gave it up and decided to make their own. And what we got was a fictional city that was pretty bloody awesome indeed. And finally, Dishonored would be announced in 2011 and at last released in 2012. So with that, let's don our fancy assassin mask and see just what kind of chaos we can cause in Dunwall. Graphically, the game looks pretty bloody good. The developers chose to go for a more stylized look to everything. Still though, everything is still quite detailed as well with numerous little elements to be found. The overall aesthetic is something of a mashup between the various punks, with elements from steam and diesel with a little bit of cyber thrown in for good measure. The world itself makes a great use of color as well. For the seedy areas, everything is dull and muted, and looks used and abused. For the richer quarters, everything looks like it is clean and bright and vibrant. This helps provide a nice dichotomy between the rich and poor in this game, thus driving home the fact that the rich of the city are quite disconnected from the poor of the city. The character models look great as well, and while the faces and bodies are not photorealistic, and instead stylized, the facial expressions themselves can convey a great deal of emotion, and do not dip into the oft-visited valley of the uncanny. In fact, these have got to be some of the most expressive faces I have seen in a video game, sans the one seen in L.A. Noir. Machine design is also excellent as well, with the machines being suitably unique. The gameplay for Dishonored is pretty much the same as the gameplay seen in Deus Ex Human Revolution in just about every way that matters. You're in a first-person perspective all throughout, and thus have to use both good spatial awareness and caution when moving throughout a level. In the game, you have access to three main weapons. You have a sword, a personal weapon, 
a pistol, and a crossbow that reminds me a bit of the one seen in Deus Ex 1. Also, like in Deus Ex Human Revolution, you have the ability to do takedowns on unaware enemies. As mentioned earlier, the game tracks how many people you kill, be it in self-defense or otherwise. And this might seem limiting, but in all reality, it's nothing of the sort. You don't have to worry about killing one or maybe two guards. And really, it only comes into play if you kill, like, all the bloody guards. So no, you're not going to get the bad ending if you kill one bloody guy. In fact, if you try to go for a pacifist playthrough, likely you're going to accidentally kill one or two guards here and there. Really, it all comes down to playing smart more than anything else. It is, of course, up to the player as to how they approach a particular fight. Like in Deus Ex Human Revolution, the battle not fought is the best kind of battle. In Deus Ex Human Revolution, you wanted to primarily use takedowns, and you wanted to use silenced or stealth-styled weapons. And that's the case in Dishonored. The knife and the gun are both somewhat useless. Really, the only time the knife would come into play is if you really screwed up bad. But if it comes to that, you probably should just reload the quick save. Because like in Deus Ex Human Revolution, you can quick save whenever you bloody well want, and you don't have to go through that annoying checkpoint system. Now, the gun just doesn't work very well. It's a single shot, it takes a while to reload, and it's bloody well loud. This is a stealth game in every sense of the word. If you fire off that loud gun, every bloody guard's gonna come after you, and they're gonna be braying for your blood. Really, the best weapon, and to me, the only good weapon in the game, is the Deus Ex 1-styled crossbow. It can fire a number of bolts, but really the only bolt worth using is the sleep bolt. Now, this sleep bolt will thankfully work way better than it did back in Deus Ex 1, and will take down an enemy in one hit. And thankfully, the crossbow is stealthy, as it doesn't make any noise when fired. And it actually can be reloaded fairly quickly as well. Far quicker, in fact, than the gun. Now, this whole freedom of choice thing that really should be banned because it's, you know, makes you think and that's evil, does indeed tie in to the concept of the mission objectives. When you are sent out on a mission, it is up to you as to how to complete said mission. You're never really railroaded as to what you have to do. Now, many of your missions revolve around taking out a target. You can kill them by slitting their throats with your epic knife, or you can have some sort of context-sensitive way of dispatching them. You can also just render them unconscious and thus leave them to a rather ironic fate. The non-lethal options are far harder than the lethal options, as you would expect. Usually, to have one of the non-lethal options present itself, you have to complete some sort of side objective that takes you all over the level and can, of course, introduce you to some cool characters. And in my opinion, at least, the non-lethal method is the most satisfying. But sometimes you want to get just a little stabby-stabby in. But once again, all of this is left up to the player. One thing I find kind of funny is the fact that the game touts this play your way concept as this majorly creative innovation. Now another cool aspect about the levels is the fact that there are cool things randomly happening throughout them. And in a rare example of a modern game actually doing this, there are some things that you can miss on your first playthrough, thus giving this game actual replayability that is actually separate from the bloody multiplayer. Next, we have the various superpowers. Now in the game, Corvo Atino is a recipient of various supernatural powers. These are given to you via the Cthulhu Whale, aka the Outsider, who acts as a sort of off-brand Q, and he will pop up from time to time to yammer at the player. But as a fan of Star Trek and the Cthulhu mythos, he is nothing all that special. Really, while the powers are cool enough, the game is built around the use of one power the blink port power and really you can get through the game using just this one power the others are more for fun than anything else and you can play the entire game without even using the powers so if you are a pro mlg thief player you don't have to lower yourself to such a casual state like with deus ex human revolution there is an upgrade system although instead of cyberware it's actually a bit weirder you have upgrades for your powers which work by collecting whalebone tchotchkes and of course you can actually collect little whale bits that can give you passive upgrades your weapons are upgraded in a separate fashion you go to a merchant 
and you can talk to him to get some upgrades for your gun, which you'll never use, and your crossbow, which you'll want to use all the bloody time, and he'll actually give you some passive upgrades to your armor and things of that nature. The technological upgrades are not free! That bloody merchant expects to be well paid, and so you have to collect money by stealing things, and I like stealing, I like taking things. Although the stealing mechanic is rather simplified from the Thief games. In the Thief games, you could steal stuff and then take it to a fence and get money that way. Here, the instant you steal something, it just is immediately turned into money. How this makes sense, I couldn't really say, and it would be kind of cool to have to balance what you want to steal with a limited inventory system. As good as the gameplay is, the story is actually even better. The overall story for the game harkens back to the good old days of gaming and is actually quite well written. You take on the role of Corvo Atino, and the world you inhabit is the city of Dunwall, a sort of cyber diesel steampunk world that runs on magical whale oil. Rather than needing whalers at the moon to carry a harpoon, we instead have magical giant whales, well, gianter I guess, that yield magical oil that is actually pretty damn potent as it can power shield generators and things of that nature. When the game opens up, you are returning to the city after an off-screen mission. The game starts up pretty slowly, actually, and we are introduced to a pretty cool child character. In games and movies, kids are almost always done wrong. They're either A, completely annoying, or B, completely useless. Thankfully in Dishonored, this particular kid character is nothing of the sort. Emily is one of the few well-written child characters, and throughout the game she actually stays fairly endearing, and is actually on par with the character of Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite. But the happy homecoming is cut short by an assassin attack on the Empress of Dunwall. And of course, it is able to succeed, because if it didn't, we wouldn't have a bloody game, now would we? And of course, Corvo is immediately framed by the corrupt governmental officials of Dunwall and is immediately thrown into prison, after which he immediately escapes and begins the crusade to bring freedom back to the city of Dunwall. The whole game is excellently well written and well put together. The voice acting is actually halfway decent for the most part, but it can get stilted at times. In many cases, when it comes to games with great voice acting, the gameplay is fairly simplistic, and games with moderate voice acting, the gameplay is rather complicated. I don't particularly have a problem with, shall we say, passable voice acting, because it means they spent less money on Kevin Spacey and more money on game design. Dishonored uses two separate methods for expanding the game world. It uses the now standard audio log, which don't really make much sense for the level of tech that we're dealing with here. I just can't imagine people putting their thoughts to these weird punch card things, as it really would make a lot more sense for them to just write it down. And since that's the case, there are plenty of written text logs that you can pick up, and there are even books here and there that go a long way towards expanding this constructed world. I personally feel that the constructed world is a very cool concept, because it ensures that one will see something that one hasn't seen before. Instead of Victorian London, we instead have a city that is somewhat like it, but subtly different. Essentially, in order to create a constructed world, the developers must have greater creativity and they can actually create something new rather than just rehashing the same old tired concept over and over again. The story can also be changed slightly depending on what you do in the game. One funny thing you can do is sign the guest book at an aristocratic party in pure James Bond fashion, and then a villain will remark upon it in a later level. The game also has a great number of side characters as well. Sam the Boatman is actually pretty bloody well acted and pretty bloody cool. Probably the single coolest side character out of the entire lot is Piero. He is the guy you go see to get upgrades to your technological equipment. He is cool mainly because he is voiced by Brad Dorf. Brad Dorf is a pretty bloody famous character actor known for playing creepy and crazy characters. In Alien Resurrection, he played Dr. Geekman, the evil scientist who brought back the Xenomorphs. In Star Trek Voyager, he played a Betazoid serial killer, and most recently, he is supposed to be playing a character in the new Reanimator film. And he is just as creepy and crazy in this game, too. And is that much more memorable for it? Some of the characters will give you optional mission objectives as well, like saving certain characters from death and things of that nature. One final thing to note is how everyone can come to really like and respect Corvo. In so many games, the player character never gets any respect. Here, Corvo is treated with the due respect that he deserves as a living engine of death. Or as a guy who saves people and is generally a hero too.
In all reality, Dishonored isn't anything groundbreaking, but what it is, is a game. It's a game with a soul. It's a game with gameplay, and it's a modern game with both. So really, it's notable for that, if nothing else. And I highly recommend it. Now on 11-11-16, in an attempt to cash in on the memories of Skyrim, we're going to get a new Dishonored game, Dishonored 2. Will it be as good as Dishonored 1? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. But here's hoping it continues with the excellence of the first game. And so, I am General Ott, wishing you good Thief 1 and good Thief 2, whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of Dishonored, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue to bring you these great reviews.